Good morning. How is everybody? How is everybody doing? Uh, okay? No? Yeah? No? Oh, my. That <laughs> with tic-tac-toes. All right. Don't color under the seats with tic-tac-toes. All right. What did you learn in class today? David took care of the sheep. David took care of the sheep. How did he take care of the sheep? Uh, he, he poured some oil when they got scratched and hurt. And they, he let he lead them through the water and grass and, and go to a tree when it was hot outside. If you got hurt, could I pour oil on your owl? No. All right. I didn't think so. I didn't think so. What did you learn in class? Joseph. Joseph. Very good. That was awesome. What did everybody else learn? Who who learned something? What did you learn? I played games. Fun. That's fun. I like playing games. What did you learn? I played games. Well, what kind of games did you play? I guess I learned about Jesus dying. Oh, yeah. It's sad, but also so good that Jesus died for us. That's very true. He did die on the cross. And you have something else? And then he went to heaven. Yeah. Very good. I got a rock. You got a rock? That's pretty good. All right. You know what? It's kind of harvest season. Does everyone know what harvest season is? It's when you can go pick fruit. So you can't get the spirit from us. Can't. Cannot. Get, get it. Cannot. Grape. Nope. You can't get the spirit from a watermelon. Watermelon. Nope. You can't get the spirit. You might as well hear it. A apple. Apple's not a fruit of the spirit, for the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. You can't get the spirit from a grape. Grape. Nope. You can't get the spirit from a love. Love, yes, you can't get the spirit. You might as well hear it, A. Joy. Joy is a fruit of the spirit, for the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You can't get the spirit from a... Cuckoo clock. Cuckoo clock, nope. You can't get the spirit from a... Dinosaur. Dinosaur, nope. You can't get the spirit... You might as well hear it, eh? Sausage. Sausage ain't the fruit of the spirit, for the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. You can't get the spirit from a pear. Pear. Nope. You can't get the spirit from a joy. Joy. Yes, you can't get the spirit. You might as well hear it, eh? See. Seat isn't a fruit of the spirit, for the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Ready? Deep and wide. Deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Hmm, and wide, hmm, and wide, there's a fountain flowing hmm and wide. Hmm, and wide, hmm, and wide, there's a fountain flowing hmm and wide. Hmm. And hmm, hmm, and hmm, there's a fountain flowing hmm and hmm. Hmm, and hmm, hmm, and hmm, there's a fountain flowing hmm and hmm. Hmm, and hmm, hmm, and hmm, there's a hmm, hmm, flowing hmm and hmm. Hmm, and hmm, hmm, and hmm, there's a hmm, hmm, flowing hmm and hmm. Hmm, and hmm, 
All right, go have a seat. I'm always impressed when Tom can be quick on his feet and turn cannot into can and joy yes and no and fruits and vegetables and all that. It is a wonderful day to be praising God. Let's be standing as we sing this morning. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his mean loved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power. Who in the strength of Jesus trusts? Who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror. Stand then in his great might with all his strength endued. But take to arm you for the fight. But take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. That having all things done and all your conflicts past, you may or come through Christ alone. You may or come through Christ alone and stand entire at last. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for giving us a chance to come together and sing songs of praise and worship you. Uh, Father, as we worship this morning, help us to, to sing out with, with all of our hearts and, and lift our voices to you in song and open our hearts to the to the things that you uh, have for us this morning. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. O oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing, all my heart I sing, great are you, Lord, worthy of praise, holy and true, great are you, Lord, most holy Lord.
All my heart I sing, great are you, Lord, worthy of praise, holy and true, great are you, Lord, most holy. sing great are you Lord worthy of praise holy and true great are you Lord most holy Lord be seated please Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. How proud! did that grace appear the hour I first believed when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first meet First Corinthians chapter 1 starting in verse 25 it says for the foolishness of God is wiser than mankind And the weakness of God is stronger than mankind. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many 
sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have pained my ransom, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have pained my ransom. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like to uh, reflect back on um, Jesus when he partook of it with the disciples and when he established that with them. Um, I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 26. And it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. As, as we get ready to partake of this bread, which represents his body, and the, the juice, which represents his blood, I'd like for us all to take a moment and reflect on that sacrifice that he gave for us so that him going to the cross to die for our sins so that we could have a chance of being with him in heaven. So let's play, pray for the bread. Dear God, thank you for, for all that you've done for us, for your son's sacrifice that he, he went to so willingly, where um, he was beaten and, and hung on a cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. I pray that we reflect on that as, as we partake of this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue with our prayer. Dear God, as we continue through this, we, we pray uh, a, for this fruit of the vine, that was, which represents your son's blood that was shed on the cross for us. Please help us to uh, partake of this in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.
As has become our tradition here with the uh, changes that we've gone through, the collection bags obviously aren't passed anymore. There is the, the collection at the back of the auditorium. Um, for, for those of you who have something to give, I would encourage that. Um, let us pray for, for that. Dear God, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the blessings that you've given to us, for, for the cars that we can drive, the houses that we have, the freedoms that we experience here in this country. Um, I pray that as we reflect on this time that we would uh, give back to you with generous hearts. Lord, thank you for, for all that you bless us with. In Jesus' name, amen. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. And at the end of our journey, we shall bow down on bended knee. And with the angels up in heaven, we'll sing the song of victory, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed glory and honor and dominion unto the lamb unto the king oh hallelujah hallelujah we sing the song of the Good morning. I don't want to see anybody running for the exits. Tom is back today and he's going to be bringing the lesson. So, um, A few things I wanted to bring up. First of all, we had great success with our ministry fair last week. And I know there were some people that missed it. Uh, if you did miss it, the sheets are set up on the uh, table outside in the hallway out here. And go through and read about them, what, what they are, the person in charge of that ministry is listed on there. So if you see a name and you have a question, um, go ahead and talk to them and, and sign up for something. If you haven't signed up for something uh, and you don't know what you would best be fitted for, Come see uh, Mark or Dan or I, and, and we'll give you some guidance or, or uh, give you a rake, if nothing else, and you can clean up around the building. So anyway, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, all that was uh, volunteered last week and the interest that was shown and for the men that, uh, uh, for that, and, and especially uh, Dina for putting that together for us. The service for Melly Conson is coming up on... Uh, November 4th, it'll be here at the building in the afternoon. Uh, watch uh, the announcements for that. Heather Hadler will be going in for surgery on the 10th of November, and uh, she would appreciate prayers of the congregation for that. Um, I know that that's concerning to the whole family. And uh, Caden Shemansky is going in for surgery on the 30th of uh, October, so a week from tomorrow. Caden's going in for surgery, um, so we uh, want to keep Caden in our, in our prayers. The last thing I wanted to mention this morning is uh, the world situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, I would ask you to uh, go to God, beseech him on behalf of, the, of those that have lost their lives, those that are suffering from that, 
for the families and and that are dealing with it and especially that a resolution a peaceful resolution could be found things are that we're in a dangerous situation right now and I think it's worthy of us to go to our father about that let's go to God in prayer our father we thank you once again for this beautiful day for this season that we have to see your beauty in your creation and and all that you provide our father it reminds us of how much love you have for us how much you have uh, uh, planned for us and and especially your plan of salvation the sacrifice of your son that that we could have a promise of a home eternal with you our father we lift up those that we have mentioned that you would be with them as they face surgery and and ongoing challenges we ask you to be with their families and and uh, comfort them and we just pray for a positive outcome in each situation our father we uh, raise the world situation to you and the dangers that that are ongoing we pray that uh, uh, rulers would would uh, turn to you that uh, their confidence would be placed in you our father we just pray that uh, uh, things would calm down and that uh, peace would be restored our father we ask you to be with all those that are suffering the loss of loved ones and family members uh, comfort them be with those that are that have family members that are that are uh, being held hostage and and comfort them we pray that they would safely be returned to their families our father we know that you are in charge we know that uh, that all things happen uh, with your understanding our father and so we just put our confidence in you our father this morning we also would lift up the parents in this congregation as they raise their children we ask you to give them the wisdom and the perseverance that they need to to uh, raise them in a way that they would want to follow you our father we ask you to be with tom as he brings a lesson to us help us to have open minds and hearts and his words to come quickly and easily to him father these things we ask in your son's name At this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss the little ones age three through first grade. Come on down. Um, we'll have you come right on out this door if you have a contribution. You're welcome to drop it in the box on your way out. For everyone else, let's stand if we would. Let's read this verse together, and then we'll sing one more time before we hear from Tom this morning. Let's read together, starting in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 1. It says, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. Bless your name, you are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, when I am weak, you are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Jesus, seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy. 
name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, worthy is your name. Be seated, please. I had a couple of things to go over before I begin. Uh, one, next, this coming Saturday is our trunk or treat car Naval. Get it? So you make something. The Smiths aren't laughing. I thought it was funny, but <laughs> car Naval. Uh, so decorate your trunk, have some games for the kids to play, and, and really come and enjoy. It's, it's a great fun day. This is going to be one of the colder, you know, trunk or treat, car, Nivals that, that we've had. So bundle up, wear, you know, thicker costume, but come be involved. It's a wonderful time, and it's a great way to just, you know, interact with the community. Have kids come in, we give them candy. It's a safe environment uh, where people can ha come and have a good time. Uh, in, to, in today's climate, you never know what, what is going to be out there, but at least here we can afford something for, for our members, for the neighborhood to come and be involved, and it's a great way, once again, to interact. Uh, today, if you have and your kids are participating in LTC coming up in April, I want you to, to have your forms filled out. Turn those into Judy Huelga if you have them ready to go. Let her know. Donnie's out of town today, so hand that over to Judy if you if your kids want to be involved. And then this coming Saturday at the Trunk or Treat Car Nival. Okay, it's, it's, not, it's not going. They can have a service requirement met if they show up and help out in some way, taking out trash, being involved in that regard. So if that's something that, that you would like to have, get that, that service requirement for LTC, uh, you can meet one of, that, one of those requirements this coming weekend. And I was also told this month, this morning by, uh, uh, by Marin that her sister-in-law, Jess Cole, is in her second stage or in the second trimester of pregnancy. And they've tried multiple times through IVF, failed attempts, and then uh, through, as Marin said, the old-fashioned way, they've gotten pregnant. And so that's a very cool thing, and, and God is good, and he's working in that regard. And so uh, we'll put that on our prayer list so that we can be praying for Jess Cole and her family as well. I missed you all last week. I really did. It's odd to be away, even though I'm at a body of believers, I'm at church, quote unquote, being away from you all, no matter where I'm at, it's a hard thing. And so I missed you. I'm glad to be back. Although I heard Rod had you out of here by 1130. Um, so now I have to make up the difference. So we're going to go, yeah, maybe an hour and a half. We'll see if I can if I can squeeze it all in in an hour and a half. And uh, so buckle up, be ready to go. You know, speaking at one of those big lecture ships, ships I, I, get, I get kind of full of myself. Um, and I'm reminded of the song by Mac Davis. You know, oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. We certainly get big heads and large egos. And so often, this is the downfall of humanity. We, and as we've been considering this idea of true power and how God reveals that in Scripture, I'm reminded by, of, of one of the best passages that you can come in contact with. When you think about God's power, God's provision coming in the smallest of ways. And so with that in mind, we're going to turn to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6 has, has a beautiful thought about God's power being revealed in just the tiniest of ways. Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Usually when things that are evil, this means that they started chasing after idols, idolatry. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord handed them over to Midian for seven years. Have you ever considered how long seven years really is? 
You know, for us, we look back, seven years ago was 2016. 2016 may not seem so long, but I didn't have any kids in 2016. Now I have three boys, and Theo will be six years old next week, or in a week and two days. When I start thinking about seven years, seven years is a very long time. Think about what it means for even our, our world. That was, that was two presidential cycles ago. Can you believe that? 2016, in October of 2016, Barack Obama was our president. And it's hard to believe what changes in two, or in two presidential cycles in seven years. And here Israel is oppressed for seven years. You know some other trends that happened in 20, 2016? These were the big trends of 2016. Uh, you had dabbing, right? Oh, I can't even do it anymore. Uh, dabbing. There was Harambe. Remember that poor gorilla story? There was the mannequin challenge where everybody tried to be a mannequin. And there were water bottle flipping trick shots and things of that nature. That seems like such a long time ago in our culture. Things revolve so quickly. Seven years is a long time. And if you could imagine what it would be like to be oppressed for seven years, we have, we have major conflicts in the world going right now. You think about uh, the situation in, with Ukraine and Russia. That's only been a couple of years. Can you imagine seven years handling a situation like that. On a spiritual level, there's even this connotation of, of needing rest during a seven-year span. There are things that bog us down. And in this instance, God has chosen the Midianites to cause the Israelites to course correct and return to them. And so we continue, Judges chapter 6, verse 2, the power of Midian prevailed against Israel because, the Midian, because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. Can you imagine what it would be like to be living within a cave? To say, I can't live in my home anymore. I will go into a cave, bury myself away, hide myself in, in the, the cleft of the rock. You know, we sing a lot of songs about this. On a spiritual sense, could you imagine this being your daily reality to hide within a cave? To be sheltered just in, in this area where, where the, the Midianites are coming to bear down upon you. And now we, we get the whole situation. What we know about Midian, the Midianites, is that they were a group of nomadic herdsmen. And so they would take their, their sheep and their cattle and they would go into a region and they would just basically kind of decimate the countryside. And so while their animals were grazing, they would go into that region and they would plunder it. They would take all the resources that were there. So if you were, were there and they came in, they would come and they would start, you know, they would graze on your pasture land and then they would come and take your stuff as well. They were... They were a, a very domineering civilization. And what they would do is they would leave no resources for you for the coming year. And, and it got so bad that Israel resorts to hiding in caves and in holes in the ground. And as we continue to read in Judges chapter 6, we get the whole gist of the situation. As we continue to read, what we discover is that for whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites. There we go. And the people of the east and march against them. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. And leave no sustenance in Israel, nor a sheep, ox, or donkey. For then they would come up with their livestock in their tents, they would come in like locusts in number. And both they and their camel, camels were innumerable. And they came into the land to ruin it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Can you imagine this situation? The way that it is described is like locusts descending on the land. And, and right now there's a documentary uh, 
a documentary on Netflix about this, this plague of locusts that comes in, starts in Ethiopia. And it starts out as grasshoppers, and it becomes so, so intense that there's, there's no food left. And it goes all the way from Ethiopia and Africa all the way to India. And it's this cloud of locusts. And you start thinking that this is how it's described, that the Midianites would come into a region and they would descend like locusts. And, and you start thinking, like, what would this be like to live in a world where everything that I had was consumed? Not only this, but we're told that in this process, they would even take your, your animals, your donkeys, your ox. So the things that you could use next year to plant a harvest, that would be gone as well. Everything that you had would be taken away. It almost becomes a reality that's difficult for us to fully comprehend. And so the Midianites would come in like locusts and they would devour everything. They would leave nothing for the people to eat. And they would even take anything that would make harvest possible. And so they're asked this one question, what will God do? How will he deliver Israel from this evil nation? What will God do to step into this, into this area where, where it seems like devastation and carnage is following them at every turn? There's many times in our lives that we ask the same question. What will God do for us? And then we're told at the very beginning of this that it is something that God has allowed to happen. He is the one that has handed over Israel to the Midianites. He has done this for a very specific purpose. And so sometimes when we're faced with adversity, God is trying to get our attention. And when we're in these tough situations, instead of saying, what will God do? Our response should be, am I clinging to God in this circumstance? So often when we face a hard situation, we want to know, God, why is this happening? What will you do to deliver me from this situation? And what we should be asking is, am I clinging to God? regardless of what happens. And then, when it is too much to bear, we often cry out to the Lord for deliverance. And I, if you can imagine seven years of nothing, every time you plant a harvest, it is immediately consumed. Every time you have a little bit left over, it is gone. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have my life constantly in jeopardy. In Judges 6, 7 through 9, God sends an unnamed prophet to tell the people of Israel. He tells them to, to start behaving in a certain way. This, this prophet, he gives them some, some specific. I encourage you, go read Judges 6 and 7 later today. It's, it's an amazing passage about God's provision. But what the, what the prophet wants the children of Israel to do is to remember what God has done. He specifically reminds them to remember when they came out of Egypt. Remember what God is able to do. He delivered you from a superpower, which was Egypt. What can he do for you now? And then he also encourages the people to listen to God, to obey him, to follow him. We move down to Judges chapter 6, verse 11. And then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Orphra, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite as his son Gideon. And I stopped halfway into, the, into that verse. There's an oak tree. The angel of the Lord comes to sit under the oak. This is a very good starting point because the last judge also sat under a tree. The last judge had a great deliverance. And so what starts under a tree, this seems like a very, very good thing. In fact, if we go to Judges chapter 4, this is what it says. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. And she used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel went up to her for judgment. So here we have the angel of the Lord comes to this place. It's under an oak tree. The last time we saw a tree was with Deborah. And so this seems like, hey, there's a pattern that is developing there's a tree in the middle of nowhere, and this is where a judge will be found. It seems like a very promising thing. Yet, this next person is not a Deborah. It is not Deborah. And as we read, it's a far different than the last encounter with a judge. 
God is going to do something completely different with someone that is, that is the opposite of, of Deborah. He's going to work with a very panicking and distrusting individual. Judges 6.11 in its entirety. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Orpah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, and his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. This is far removed from our culture, and so we'll break this down. The scene is supposed to be a comical image. In this short passage, as you read this, the information to the ancient reader would have made them chuckle. You would have been able to depict a couple of things. One, the process of threshing wheat was a very big event. In order to do it, you can see how it's even done today in more remote places where people would would actually beat the stalks of wheat. And then what happens is the wheat, because it is heavier than the chaff, would fall to the earth and you could scoop that up. But it's a big process. And it requires air movement. Because if there's no air movement, then then it all kind of falls to the same place and it becomes a very futile process. And so we read that there's a man, Gideon, who is in an enclosed place, a wine press, and he is doing this process. And so what he's doing is, as he hits the wheat, you can imagine what this would be like as it falls into this pit. All the chaff, all the wheat is all combined in this same location. What he's doing is is not effective. What he's doing is, as we would say, kind of grasping at the wind. It's it's taking it's doing something with no or little effect. You're you're just making the process harder on yourself. And you can imagine how hard this would be if you were to continually thresh wheat within a wine press. It also gives us this idea that the, the crop was so small that it could be done in a very enclosed place. And so as you read through this, you would say, oh, there's this guy. His name is Gideon. He's kind of kind of a coward. He's kind of hiding out in this place, threshing wheat, because he doesn't want the Midianites to take even the smallest, most meager crop. And then we have Judges, chapter 6, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, valiant warrior." This is an incredible contrast. The man that was hiding in a wine press while threshing wheat is greeted by an angel of the Lord. Valiant warrior. What a contrast. He is is given this title that is often reserved for only the bravest of the brave. It's given to someone that, that has, uh, you know, has already won battles. And here is Gideon hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat. And what happens next is telling, verse 13. Then Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has this happened to us? Gideon is frustrated. Here he is. Threshing wheat in a wine press. He has one question. Where is God? He says, and where are his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did the Lord not bring us up from Egypt? I want to know what, what, what of these miracles that we have heard of. But now the Lord has abandoned us and has handed us over to Midian. Where is God? Where is he in the midst of this? Here I am, I'm scared, I'm hiding. Where is God? This question, he's confused, he's downtrodden. Where is God? He delivered us from Egypt. He was the one that brought us into Canaan who fought all of our battles. Where is God? Even as you look at the book of Judges, so far he has used Ehud and Deborah and Othniel. Great individuals to deliver him, to deliver Israel from their oppressors. Where is he now? Where is God in the midst of all of this? We have heard story of God's deliverance our entire lives. Where is God? We already know the answer. 
God is working to galvanize, to bolster Israel's faith and allegiance towards Him. For them to cling to Him. So where is God? Well, we, what comes next, the, the answer is not what Gideon wanted, but it is one that we should take note of. I also want you to notice the change in the personage. The angel of the Lord changes in, in Judges chapter 6, verse 14. And the Lord looked at him and said, Go in this strength of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? God has just put Gideon in his place. Gideon's question is, where is God? This is a hard, difficult situation. Where is God? And God's reply is, have I not sent you? Man, that's a, that's a gut punch. Where are you, God? Are you not there? Gideon? Sometimes we're asking for deliverance from God and his reply is that I have already equipped you. I have already given you everything that you need. You want deliverance? Well, you, here you are. And God requires us to put in our own work, to do hard things. And this is life. God gives us so much and he, then he asks us to, to finish it. We want God to remove the obstacle from my life. Take care of it. Get rid of it. Move it out of the way. And he repeats back to us, ah, pick up your cross and follow me. We want, we want it to be gone. We want, to, hey, I want an easy life. I want an easy road. And his response is, okay. Pick up your cross. Take care of it. And then Gideon, just like us, the excuses start rolling in. Verse 16. But he, that is Gideon, said to him, O oh Lord, how am I to save Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. Oh, you want, you want to send me to, to be a part of this deliverance plan? We know that Manasseh is a smaller half-tribe split with Ephraim. And then of all the tribes, so it's small in and of itself, his family is a smaller section of this half-tribe anyway, and he is the youngest of his family. As Gideon relays this information, he is sitting there and he is saying, there has to be a better choice, God. There has to be someone else. Isn't there someone more prominent? Isn't there someone that is older, maybe more capable, someone who has done this before? Even his family name is indicative of his situation. His family name, Abiezrite, means that my father is my helper. In that culture, sons help their fathers. Fathers do not help their sons. It means that he has not graduated or matured to that place where, where he would be able to hold for himself. And so there, there becomes this understanding that he is, the, he is the youngest person from the weakest family from the smallest tribe. He is David and Goliath before David and Goliath. He is the smallest of the small of the small. He says there's got to be someone better. There's got to be anyone else. It can't be me. And so Gideon, he prepares this meal of unleavened bread, soup, a goat. He is instructed to set it on a rock, pour the soup over the bread and the meat. And then this messenger of the Lord touches it. And the entire meal is consumed by fire that comes out of the rock. This confirms the identity for Gideon. And he knows that he has been commissioned by God to do something amazing. And this is where his journey began. And God, in the next, the next sentence, God asked Gideon to start a spiritual revolution before there was a physical deliverance. What he asked Gideon to do next is he says, well, let's go ahead and read it. But look at this principle before we move forward. Oftentimes, we want this physical deliverance in our life. We would like the obstacle to be removed from us, whether, no matter what it is. A personal relationship, a problem at work. You know, maybe it's something physical. 
in your life. But God says, first, let's start with a spiritual revolution. Why isn't God working in your life? Perhaps it's because you're still worshiping idols. Maybe the reason that God isn't doing something at this part is because you aren't fully trusting in God. And Judges chapter 6 is, is the object lesson that we need. Now on the same night, the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and a second bull, seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut, it, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this stronghold in an orderly way, and take a second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, which you shall cut down. Then Gideon took ten men from his servants and did as the Lord had spoken to him. And because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city to do it by day, he did it by night. There's a great symbolism in this passage alone. Bulls were the representation of, of Baal and the god El. The fact that, that, Gideon, that God wants Gideon to tear down the altar to Baal with its physical representation is, is something to be said. Here is the bull god, and I am going to tear it down with this physical representation. And then he says, build another altar to God, but use the wood from the Asherah pole. This should elicit a, an ancient chuckle from within. <laughs> You're tearing down one to build up something else. And then he also asked him to sacrifice a bull that is seven years old. How long had the Midianites oppressed Israel? For seven years. And so in, in, in one great object lesson, God is telling Gideon, exercise all of those evils that have plagued the land for the last seven years. Tear all of those, those spiritual detriments to your life, and then we're going to do something great. Take down everything that, that, has, that has corrupted you for the last seven years and get rid of it. Tear it out. Start over. Start worshiping God and God alone. And it must have built Gideon's confidence because what we see next is that although he was too afraid to do it by day, he starts moving forward. He starts moving forward to this next phase. Gideon, he, he has what we call the fleece, the situation of the fleece contained in Judges chapter 6. He tears down the altar, but he still doesn't, doesn't fully believe God is going to do great things. Then Gideon said to God, if you're going to save Israel through me as you have spoken. God, I know that you can save Israel, but if you're going to do it through me as you have spoken, I'm going to need some proof. I'm going to need something that, that tells me that I'm capable of this. God, I know you can, but if you're going to save them through me, I need to know who you are. And so he does this, this wonderful thing with a fleece and it being wet and the ground being dry and then the ground is wet and then the fleece is dry. And it, it's this reassurance that Gideon knows that God is going to use him. God can do these amazing things that seem unbelievable and he's going to use me in a very counterintuitive way. And what we see next is, is Gideon, who has been nicknamed Jerubbabel, He's going to start working with God and not against him. Then Jerubal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him got up early and camped beside the spring of Harad. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to hand Midian over to them. Otherwise, Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has saved me. Now therefore come, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and worried is to return and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 from the people returned, but 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water. 
and I will test them for you there. So it shall be that he of whom stay with you, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But every one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not come. And so he brought the people down to the water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, you shall put everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps in one group, and everyone who kneels down to drink in another. Now the people of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But the rest of the people kneeled down to the water to drink. This is where we've wanted to get this entire morning. We got to the backstory. Here we are at the meat of the passage. And this is where we will, we will finish. God is clear that there is a purpose of dwindling the forces of Israel. It's so that the people can rely upon God and, and focus on him no matter what. If you think of the cycle of the judges... The people fall away from God. There is a foreign group that oppresses them. God raises up a deliverer. The people are delivered. Times are good. People forget God and people fall away from God. How do you stop this cycle? How do you stop this cycle that is, that is a continual process of God delivering them, times becoming good and then them falling away again? What, what do you do in this circumstance? And the reason that there is a cycle is because at some point, the people start to to chase a lifestyle that is independent and separate from God. And that is the cycle that needs to stop. That is the cycle that you have to say that when things are, whether they are prosperous or whether they're destitute, whether it is good or whether, whether it is a bad season, then no matter what, you will follow God. But this mentality is... It's just about a sharing of victory. Ah, all these good things happen because I worked with God. But we have to change the way that we think. Israel had to change the way that they thought. They thought that it was this shared victory. But what they have to know is that it is always God's victory. Everything that had happened is because God was using them. And that they had very little part of it in and of themselves. And this is the reality when we think about our own lives. We want to take credit for our lives, for our successes. And if we don't want to take full credit, we will, at a minimum, say, I'm going to share this. Share these accolades with God. I did this, and maybe God was there too. It was all about me, and God does stuff. Behind the scenes. It is always God's victory. We must come to the realization that God is the author, the architect, and the overcomer. He is the one that secures the victory. He is the one that developed the plan. And he is the one that will see it through. It is only through and due to him that there is a victory at all. Look at what we see in Judges Seven, seven through eight. And the Lord said to Gideon, I will save you with the 300 men who lapped. I will save you. Gideon, you're doing nothing. You're merely there. God is the one that is taking control of this. And he tells the rest to go home. So have all the other people go, each man to his home. And so 300 men took the people's provisions and their trumpets in their hands. And Gideon dismissed all the other men of Israel, each to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And Midian was below him in the valley. This, this word retained, it's, it's very interesting. Gideon dismissed everyone, but he retains 300 men. And this, this word retain is that he, that he had to seize or restrain or contain those 300 men who were left. As, as God has dismissed a sizable and formidable force, the 300 who have stayed are hesitant to stay. They don't want to stay. They would like to leave, and Gideon must hold them back. This is, this is amazing. And think about the math. You started with 32,000 individuals, and now you have 300 who are left. 
I'm not a mathematician, but I can, I can look down that there's, there's a, just about 1% left of your group. In fact, 98.93% have disappeared. I would want to leave too. I would want to, okay, you, you dismissed 32,000. Can I, can I go with them? Gideon must hold them back. And this is precisely how God works. This is how he accomplishes a plan. Because he uses us in the process. And this is our take-home message. This is power revealed. It's not that we have done anything. It's that we too would like to leave. We would like to go. We don't want to be a part of this. It seems insurmountable. And yet God is going to use us in this process. If we merely start walking in faith, often our, our faith is suspect, it's frail. But then God works with this because those who would want to leave, and I am a part of that group, I say I'm going to stick it out because that is what someone of faith does. And yet it's up to us to know that it is not us, it is God and his victory. Once again, I encourage you to go home and read all of Judges chapter 7. The lessons of Gideon are deep, they're abundant. It's marvelous to see how God works in this way, how he takes a person who is scared and hiding within a wine press threshing wheat. It's amazing how he takes this one person and he's going to do something amazing with it. He's going to take a force of 32,000 individuals and he's going to dwindle it down to 300 for his purposes. God, he is God. He could have wiped out the Midianite army. He could have. That would have been an easy thing. And in other, other passages, God does far more amazing things. But there's a lesson for each and every one of us as we read through this. God doesn't work like that. He asks us to walk in faith and then uses us to display his power. Hebrews chapter 12. I think my battery's dying. I believe in it. Can you hit the next slide, Kevin? Ooh. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. God is the author, the perfecter of our race, of what we run. We like to think that we are the architect, that we have some type of control over the situation and then we read a passage like Gideon and we realize that God is really the one that is in control. God is the author. He is the finisher, the perfecter, the completer, whatever you want to call the, the, the end process. God has seen it through. We are merely in the race, which means that we still must run. But God has done the rest. And much like Gideon, who used who God used in the most unusual ways. We must just run the race that is set before us, knowing that the victory is already secured and that it was God who is in, the whole, in control the whole time. It's at this moment that we can echo the words of Paul, that when I am weak, then I am strong. When I realize that I am not in control, when I realize that I am like Gideon, the guy that's hiding out and that God is just going to use me for his purposes, then I can truly be strong. It's at those moments when I realize that, look, it's not me, it is him. And then I can do amazing things, but it's not me. It's God working in me. You know, if I could, I would always say that I saved myself. We all would. We would like to take credit, and we would boast about it, and we would brag, and we would say how great I am. But that's not faith. And that's not what God wants from us. God wants us to humble ourselves in a way to know that he is in control. That he has the power. And he did a great thing with Gideon to give us that understanding. 
So we must sit back and we must say, what is power? What is this thing that God has, has granted to us? It's to be instruments of his, of his work. It's to be a part of the plan. It's not to, to do things on my own, but rather to let him have control and for me to step back. So I encourage you, if you have those issues in your life, if you are dealing with something and you wonder why I am in the spot that I'm in, I encourage you, let God have control. Let God have, have his way with you. If you have any other needs of the congregation, I encourage you to come forward while we stand and while we sing. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is the shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver walking by faith. He will be strong to deliver me safe. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Heavenly Father, help us to know that you are in control. And Father, that you, you guide our lives and that, and that we, are, we are merely here for your purposes. And Father, as we, as we walk into this world, Father, I pray that, that that relieves us of the pressure of to do the right things and to say the right things, but to know that it, we are just, you're just instruments of your will. And Father, help us to, to change into a Gideon who is, uh, who is bold in our faith, who is willing to reach out and, and affect the world because of what you can do through us. Father, for those, who are, uh, for those who are far away, I ask you to bring them near. Father, for those who are close by, I, I encourage you to, to strengthen and uphold them. Father, walk with us as we go into, the week, into our week. Help us to be lights to a world that needs lightness. And Father, help us to, uh, to speak into the darkness and to, and to take that away. And Father, thank you for loving us more than we can ever imagine. And I thank you for Jesus who makes our lives worth living. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.